So now Games Workshop has finally given us the Plastic Sisters that have become a meme from the whole last decade. Let's take a look at how well they'll do on the tabletop. Hello and welcome back to Auspex Tactics, the strategy and tactics focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Today we're going to look at most of the core rules for the Sisters of Battle Codex. We'll be moving through everything at quite a fast rate, but I will try and have a fairly complete look at the codex. The only things that I'm not going to cover in massive detail is each and every unit datasheet, as there's just a spectacular amount of unit options and synergies here, and at some point in the future I'll certainly be looking to move through the codex, squad by squad and unit by unit, and give them all our full attention. For today though, we're going to look at their overarching special rules, including Miracle Dice, the different perks that you can get from each order, all of the many stratagems that the Sisters of Battle have access to, and their Warlord traits and relics. We will look briefly at each unit, but as I said, we'll be going at quite a fast rate to cover everything that we can in a reasonable time, so we're not going to go over literally every piece of war gear and options right now. With all that being said, let's get into it then. The Auspex Tactics review of Codex Adeptus Auroritas. Firstly, we'll start with their core rules then. Most units have an order conviction, and we'll go through those later. You get the benefit if you have an entire detachment of the same order, much like for any other codex. As I'm sure you're all aware, Acts of Faith have been revamped. They now work with Miracle Dice. The ways that these dice work are that you gain one at the start of each battle round, and you also gain a Miracle Dice if you fulfil any of the below conditions in any one phase. One can be an enemy unit is destroyed by a unit with the Acts of Faith ability, one of your characters is killed who has the Acts of Faith ability. If you make a successful Deny the Witch roll for a unit with the Acts of Faith ability, though you can't actually use an Act of Faith itself to do that roll. And finally, if you roll an unmodified one for a morale test, again without performing an Acts of Faith itself. The last one is important to note that you do, in theory, take a morale test any time your unit suffers casualties, even if it wouldn't normally be possible to fail the morale test due to the high leadership of some Sisters of Battle units. So make sure you always make that roll, because you just might get a 1 and get a Miracle Dice from it, which in my mind can only be a good thing. When you gain a Miracle Dice, you roll that dice, and then the number that you rolled stays for the rest of the game. You add it to your dice pool, so you might have a dice pool where you have a few 1s, a few 2s, a few 3s, etc. And then you use these Miracle Dice to make Acts of Faith. You can make one Act of Faith per phase, and you nominate that you're going to do this before making the roll for one of the things below. You can use it in an advance, a charge, a deny the witch test, a hit roll, a wound roll, a saving throw, a damage roll, and a morale test. So before you make this roll, you choose certain ones of your miracle dice, and you can substitute those dice into the roll before you make the roll. One of the most obvious examples would be, say, if you have a 6 as a miracle dice, you might say, yes, I'm just going to use this 6 when I'm rolling for the damage that my melter gun is inflicting on this Lehman Russ tank, for example thereby guaranteeing you that you'll get a very high damage result from that. Obviously, this means that higher Miracle Dice rolls are typically going to be more useful than lower dice rolls, but you could use any 3s as making them successful hit rolls, or use any 1s and 2s as part of morale tests to prevent your units fleeing. There are some other outlets for Miracle Dice. One of the Orders has one, you can use some in stratagems, and also several units can take a Simulacrum Imperialis, which will allow that unit to perform an act of faith even if another unit already has. So Battle Sisters are often going to be ridiculously reliable exactly when they need to be, and I think that this is really quite a powerful ability, as you'll be able to rack up the dice really quite quickly with all of these abilities, and some other unique abilities that we'll get onto later. Next up we have Sacred Rites. These are sort of like the Combat Doctrines type ability that Space Marines get, in that you get these if you have an army that is entirely Sisters of Battle in that they have the either Adeptus Auroritas and or the Adeptus Ministorum keywords. Differently to Combat Doctrines though, you get to pick one of these at the start of the game, so you can potentially use these to tailor to your opponent's army list, as you don't have to declare it on your army. Either you pick one of these, or you can choose to roll two dice rolls to have two random effects in game. I think both are potentially powerful, obviously having two abilities is stronger than one, but often having exactly the ability that you need the most might outweigh two other buffs that you didn't need as much. Some of these are really decently powerful. We have plus one to advance and charge, 
a 5 plus to have a model make another attack when they die, either shoot a weapon or make a close combat attack, an ability similar to the company Ancients for the Space Marines, except it's army wide. You can have plus 3 to deny the witch tests, which can actually make your regular sisters squads actually pretty decent deniers, and could really hamper a psychic army. You can get a shooting buff, so any wound rolls of 6 are an extra AP-1 when they shoot. That's a very solid, reliable one that should have a lot of impact over the game. You can have the Passion, which gives you exploding 6s in melee. So every hit of 6 makes another hit. That's usually going to be equal to a 20-25 to 25 combat buff throughout your army. Again, very strong. And finally, you can reroll morale, which is a little bit of a dodd one in my opinion. I do think that most of them are strong, and it will depend a bit on exactly what sort of army you're playing to get the most out of them. For a shooty army, particularly an infantry-based one, I would be very tempted by the 5 plus shoot when you die or make the combat attack when you die ability. Shooting in your opponent's phase could be incredibly powerful, as you'll often be able to kill incoming threats before things happen to you with them, or maybe shoot exposed units that were just about to line up for a charge. Obviously, to deny the witch one is great against psychic armies and could be a good buy-in against them. And both plus one to advance and charge and exploding sixes in melee are both excellent bonuses for melee armies. And you have the choice between more reliable charges and better melee when you get there. Both are great. The sixes make AP minus one in shooting. To be honest, is a reasonably weak buff, but it does have the advantage of being on all the time for all the units in your army. And that certainly will add up to more failed saves for your opponent over the course of the game. Overall, I really like the idea that they've included this as an incentive to take Mono Sisters armies. I think it's fairly well balanced, it's a nice bonus if you do, but it is something that you can live without if you'd prefer to soup and add other powerful units from other factions. Next we have Shield of Faith, which will give you a 6 plus invul save on basically every unit, and they can also deny the witch as if they were a psyker, but they only make a 1d6 dice roll when they're trying to deny rather than 2d6 meaning that unless this is buffed somehow, such as that plus 3 to denials trait that we talked about a second ago, you're actually incredibly unlikely to ever deny a psychic test with this. It requires that your opponent rolls a 5 or less on their psychic test, which will often have meant that they fail the power anyway, so this rule won't take effect. So the denial is fairly weak, but 6 plus invul certainly will help out against high AP weapons, and there are ways to make it stronger, such as one of the warlord traits. Finally, we have Zealot, which is common to quite a few of the Ministorum type units. This is basically re-roll hits if you charge. If you're using units in a Mono Sisters detachment, then they'll get Strength of Faith, which is obsec for troops as per normal. So troops on objectives will outscore non-troops that your opponent has on objectives. Finally, we have Priestly Delegation, which is a match play rule, which means that if you don't have a Ministorum Priest as part of your army, so that's either a missionary or a preacher, then you can only take one unit of Death Cult Assassins, Arco Flagellants or Crusaders, and you can only take more if you do have a Priest. To be honest, this seems like a bit of an irrelevant rule, because Priests are really quite cheap, and they can be quite useful in a number of situations, so I don't really see any reason why you wouldn't just bring one on to allow you to take more of these units. Talking of units, let's take a look through the data sheets now, and we'll start in the HQ section with the Canoness. The Canoness is your main HQ choice for Adept Sororitas. She has a reasonably fighty stat line with 4 attacks, 5 wounds, and weapon skill and ballistic skill 2 up, though of course she is hampered by strength 3. She's got a Rosarius to give her a 4 plus invul save, and she has the normal Space Marine Captain type rerolls to allow you to reroll ones when you're within 6 inches of her. For 45 points, you can buy a Canoness with a Bolt Pistol and Chainsword, and that's really quite a cheap points cost for getting a reroll ones aura on the table so she's definitely a competitive choice. She can boost her melee slightly by taking a Blessed Blade, which is Strength plus 2, AP minus 3, Damage D3, so that actually makes her a reasonable fighty prospect on the battlefield, and that just costs an extra 9 points. You could additionally take either a Rod of Office, a Null Rod, or a Brazier of Holy Fire, which costs between 5 and 12 points, so they're all quite cheap. The Rod of Office will extend her aura by 3 inches, so she can have rerolls of 1 over a 9 inch area, which is pretty huge. Certainly a decent option. The Null Rod will give her immunity from psychic powers and also have a minus one to cast aura within 18 inches, so it sort of turns her into a mini Collectus Assassin. And the Brazier of Holy Fire gives a minus one leadership penalty to demons and a once per game smite that goes off on a two up that does d3 mortal wounds within 12 inches or d6 against demons. 
The options I like best are the Blessed Blade and Rod of Office for her personally, to make her a cheap, fighty little HQ choice. Moving on, we have Celestine, who will set you back 160 points at the moment. I don't believe she's changed too much from her previous incarnation. She can heal models, particularly the Gemini Superior, with her healing tears. She has the armor of St. Catherine for a 2-up save and a 4-up invul. A nice fighty profile with strength 7 attacks from the Ardent Blade. Improves the invul save of Shield of Faith by 1 for nearby Sororitas units and gives Priests and Astra Militarum units a 6-up invul save. And when she's killed for the first time, she gets back up with all wounds restored on the roll of a 2+. plus. Very nice, very fighty, really good value overall. Next we have one of the new models, which is the Triumph of St. Catherine. This is basically like the funeral procession model that carries a whole load of relics and I believe the body of St. Catherine. It has 14 attacks and 18 wounds, but they're made at strength and toughness 3, so it sort of represents a big squad of infantry as one cool model. They get 4 attacks with the Martyr's Sword, strength plus 3, AP minus 3, damage 2, and the rest with relic weapons of strength plus 2, AP minus 1, and damage 1. It's got a ton of special rules, I think I'll need to do a review of this model at some point in the future, but between all of it it gets a 4 plus invul, auto pass morale within 6 inches, an additional miracle dice per turn, a smite aura within 6 inches where if you roll a 5 up they take mortal wounds, plus 1 to hit in melee for themselves and all other friendly Adeptus Auroritus units within 6 inches, and a few shenanigans with acts of faith miracle dice. This one's an interesting one I think. Obviously, as it's above 9 wounds, it can be targeted by any heavy weapons your opponent has, so it does run the risk of being shot down reasonably early. When it degrades, it can only use some of its special rules to represent the relic bearers being slain. It's not tied to a certain order, so you can include it in any order detachment. I think that it sounds like it's going to be best getting it up into the thick of the action with the opponent, and handing out buffs to other Sororitas units nearby. Next we have Junith Aruta the superior canoness of the Order of our Martyr Lady. She is the one on the big floating Hover Aquila. This is equipped with a Heavy Flamer, and she has the Mace of Castigation, Strength plus 2, AP minus 1, damage 2, with her 4 attacks in melee. She again improves the Invulnerable save of the Shield of Faith ability by 1 to nearby Adeptus Sororitas units, and you can reroll both hit and wound rolls of 1 for models in the Armata Lady order that are within 6 inches of her. So she's sort of like a captain and a lieutenant all in one. She'll cost you 110 points, and I think it's a decent reason to take our martyred lady. Boosted invul saves and rerolls to hit and wounds make her an exceptionally good buffing character. Next up we have the missionary. This is the priest in the HQ slot, and he'll set you back 38 points base. He's got quite a weak defensive profile, basically similar to an Astra Militarum company commander and you can only take one of him in any single battle force detachment. His rule will allow you to add one to the attacks of Adeptus Ministorum and Astra Militarum infantry within 6 inches of him, so things like the Arco Flagellants, Death Cult Assassins, that sort of thing. He also has Word of the Emperor, for when an Adeptus Ministorum model flees within 6 inches of him, on a 4+, plus it does not flee, so it can help you out a bit with morale issues as well. Primarily though, I look at him as a decent melee buffing character, to get the most out of your Ministorum units. Onto the troops now, and we have the basic Battle Sisters squad, who will now cost you just 9 points per model. They've got a whole ton of options from their new plastic kit. A particular loadout that's been going round quite a bit is giving them two Storm Bolters, one on the Sister Superior and one on a regular Battle Sister, to have a squad that can pump out a lot of bolt shots at a very cheap points cost. They can of course go up to 10 models, and if they do they can take heavy and special weapons such as multi-melters, melter guns, that sort of thing and the Sister Superior can take fancy ranged options such as pistols and condemned to bolt guns. They can take a Simulacrum Imperialis for an extra 5 points, and this just allows them to do an Act of Faith, even if another unit in your army has already done an Act of Faith. I'm not sure how worth it this is for 5 points to be honest, as you might really be wanting to use Acts of Faith on other units. Though I'd say probably the main reason to take it is if you're also taking an Incensor Cherub, which is another 5 point upgrade, then you get to generate an additional miracle dice, you roll 2d6 and pick the one you want, and then that miracle dice can only be used in that single phase, and the incense cherub is removed after that. So essentially I'd see this as 10 points to give yourself one boosted miracle dice act of faith on any one phase in the game. So it's up to you if that's worth it, possibly if you're dealing with some heavy weapons such as melter guns, that sort of thing, but for the most part I'd tend to keep these girls cheap. With these plus the canoners and missionaries, we can really fill out the battalions for very cheap, helping generate some lovely command points for all of the many, many stratagems that the assisters have. 
Moving on to the elite's choices now. We have preachers here, which are one of the Ministorum priest units, and are fairly similar to the priest from the Astra Militarum Codex. He loses the morale benefits of the missionary, but gains a minus one leadership debuff on any chaos units, and he does keep the regular plus one attack aura that the missionary does. So if you're just here for the plus one attack aura, which I usually would be for a missionary or priest, I'd be very tempted by this guy, as he only costs 30 points. Next we have Celestine's Gemini Superior. These are now just 20 points a model, so very cheap indeed. They have rules where they don't take up a detachment slot if they're in the same detachment as Celestine, and can incept incident attacks on her as well. They've got two wounds, three attacks, power swords and jump packs. I'd certainly consider them if I was taking Celestine. Interestingly enough, you don't have to take both, you can just take one if you prefer that. Next up we have the Repentia Superior and Sisters Repentia. The Repentia Superior starts at 35 points and the Sisters are 14 points per model. The Repentia Squad has a 5 up feel no pain and their 6 up inball save but no actual armour save besides that. And they're armed with Penitent Eviscerators which will typically be striking at strength 6, AP minus 3, flat 2 damage and minus 1 to hit. Though they do have the Zealot rule which will mean they're re-rolling those hits. If you can deliver them into close combat then they're going to make an absolute mess but they really are quite fragile as they're moving up as they're quite expensive slow models. The Repentia Superior has what I'd say is a medium level character and power armour stats and is armed with a neural whip which is AP minus 2. She buffs them in two ways. You can re-roll advance and charge rolls for them and re-roll wound rolls of 1 when they're in close combat. So it could easily be worth it if you are thinking about bringing a big squad of Repentia. Next we have the Celestian squad. For 10 points a model, these are your veteran battle sisters with plus 1 attacks and leadership characteristics over your base battle sister squad. Other than this, they basically have all the same options as a regular battle sister squad, and a couple of extra special rules where they can act as a bodyguard for a friendly order character to intercept wounds caused on that character on the roll of a 2-up, and then they take mortal wounds for any that they do intercept. Interestingly, you can re-roll all hit rolls when you're within 6 inches of a cannoness, so she essentially gives full chapter master style re-rolls to this squad. Provided you are taking a cannoness, and I suspect you probably should be, these guys are just flatly better than battle sisters when they're next to her. Admittedly they cost 1 point extra, but for an additional attack, leadership and full re-rolls to hit, that 1 point is incredibly good value. Next we have the Zephyrim. These are the Seraphim squad with the jump packs who are armed with power swords and bolt pistols. They overcome their measly strength of 3 by getting full re-rolls to wound in close combat. So they really do pack quite a big punch and you'll be stacking a lot of AP3 wound rolls on your enemy. They cost 17 points a model, so they're not enormously cheap, but they are a little bit tougher than your standard battle sisters as Angelic Visage gives plus 1 to their invulnerable save to a maximum of 4 up. You can take a Zephyr in Pennant for 5 points and you probably should as that gives them 4 re-rolls to charge and can also give other friendly Zephyrim squads within 6 inches 4 rolls to charge too. And as is normal with jump packs, they can set up off the board and come in from Deep Strike. Next we have some buffing characters, the Dialogus and Hospitaller and Imagifier. The Dialogus and Hospitaller are 35 points, and the Imagifier is 45. They're all cheap buffing characters, with 4 wounds, 3 attacks, and they wear power armour. The Dialogus is sort of a leadership buffing unit, her Lord Hailer adds one to leadership characteristic of sister squads within 6 inches of her. She has spiritual fortitude, which she has a 5 plus feel no pain against psychic phase mortal wounds, though that one's just for her. And she has stirring rhetoric, which when you use an act of faith for a model or unit within 6 inches of her, you can increase or decrease the value on the miracle dice by 1. This could be pretty handy if you do put her in the centre of a gun line, for example, to get the most out of those act of faith rolls. The Hospitella is a medic and functions basically in the exact same way as the Space Marine Apothecary, either healing D3 wounds on a model or setting a model back up, but you don't have to roll to see if the model is set back up like the Apothecary, it just happens, so some nice reliable healing there. Finally, the Imagifier is sort of the equivalent of a Space Marine Chaplain for the Sisters, except her buff is on permanently, you don't have to roll for a litany. When you set up the model on the battlefield, you can select one of the three following tales to tell and they all affect friendly order units within 6 inches. The Tale of the Faithful will allow you to re-roll Deny the Witch tests, could potentially be potent in combination with that Sacred Rite that gives you the bonus to that. 
There's the tale of the Stoic, potentially the most powerful one, where you ignore the minus one effect of AP minus one weapons when they target order units within six inches. And you can stack this with, I believe it's the Valorous Heart, to ignore all minus two AP weapons as well, which actually accounts for quite a lot of weapon profiles in the game. Finally, there's Tale of the Warrior, which is just add one to the strength characteristic of models within six inches. So this could be great to combine with, say, Repentia, or Order of the Bloody Rose units, that sort of thing. Overall, I think the most powerful is the Imagifier, though for just 35 points, there's really nothing to stop you including the other two as well. Next, we have three Ecclesiarchy Battle Conclave units, the Crusaders, Death Cult Assassins, and Arco Flagellants. The Crusaders are 13 points a model, and are units with a Storm Shield and Power Sword, and a 5-up Feel No Pain type save against mortal wounds. Death Cult Assassins are 4 attack level critters, that have a 7-inch movement, Death Cult Power Blades, which are essentially the same as Power Swords, and a 5-up Invul save from Uncanny Reflexes. All three of these units also have Zealot, for those re-rolls to hit on the first round of combat, the Death Cult Assassins also have Strength 4, so have some decent strength on those Power Blades. Finally, the Arco Flagellants, again, are 13 points a model. They are armed with Arco Flails, which have D3 hit rolls. For every attack, they have 2 attacks, meaning they'll typically have 4 attacks. They've got Strength plus 1, AP minus 1, and Damage 1, so it will be Strength 5 normally. They're 13 points a model, so fairly cheap, and they have 2 wounds and a 5 up Feel No Pain meaning they're actually reasonably durable, despite not having an armor save at base. You can take 3 to 10 Arco Flagellants, and 2 to 6 of the Death Cult Assassins or Crusaders. I think they're all potentially strong choices. I describe the Crusaders as more of an anvil unit that are there to not die, and the other two units as two flavors of beatstick type unit. It might be interesting to compare them with a bit of Math Hammer in another video. Moving on to the Dominion Squad now. These are our fast attack sisters. They cost 10 points a model, and have all the same options as your regular Battle Sisters, except their special rule is Vanguard, meaning that they can move as if it were the movement phase on the first battle round before the turn begins, maybe making them able to get in range with those bolt weapons even better, or just reposition safe out of enemy line of sight. They can't apply this rule to their transport anymore as they could previously, so just be aware of that. Seraphim are next, they're 11 points per model, and they come in squads of 5-10. to 10. These are the sisters with the twin pistols and jump packs, typically two bolt pistols, but they can swap it out for hand flamers and inferno pistols as well. A twin hand flamer seraphim will cost you an extra 6 points, but does provide you with 2d6 auto hit strength 3 weapons, or inferno pistols for an additional 14 points for those lovely melter shots. Obviously the hand flamers and inferno pistols will be out of range when they deep strike down, but they do have a command point stratagem that will fix that, meaning that you could have these girls drop down and fire off 4 melter shots for just over 80 points and 1 command point. They also have the angelic visage special rule that increases their shield of faith save by 1 naturally, so they'll naturally have a 5 up invulnerable save. We're on to the heavy support now, and firstly we have the iconic exorcist tank, that's typically 170 points, though it's 140 points if you arm it with conflagration missiles rather than the standard Exorcist missile launcher. It's toughness 8 and 12 wounds, so it's pretty durable. The Exorcist missile launcher is heavy 3d3, strength 8, AP-3, damage d6, so like somewhere between crack rockets and las cannons, and on average 6 shots of them, so very nice indeed. The conflagration rockets are heavy 3d6, Strength 5, AP-2, damage 1, so better suited to handling some hordes. You also get a heavy bolter, and you can take a hunter-killer missile. Some solid anti-tank ranged firepower there. Next up is the Retributor Squad, your heavy weapon sisters, and they're fairly similar to the standard Battle Sister Squad, except that four Retributors can be equipped with heavy weapons instead of a bolt gun. They also have the options to take Armorium Cherubs, and they can take two of them, which are 5-point upgrades to allow them to fire one of their heavy weapons twice. They also get plus 4 inch to the range of their heavy flamers, helping them become a bit more of a viable choice, and they get faithful advance, where they do not suffer the penalties for moving and firing heavy weapons. Could be a good way to get a bunch of multi-melters or heavy bolters on the table, or some solid and flexible heavy weapon support. Next we have Penitent Engines and Mortifiers. Penitent Engines are an interesting choice, with a movement 7, toughness 5, 5 wound vehicle, with a 4 plus armor save, and a 5 plus feel no pain. They're equipped with two heavy flamers and two boss blades or penitent flails. The boss blades are more suited towards anti-tank, being strength 8, AP-3, damage 2 weapons, and the penitent flails will have 12 attacks in total, as they multiply your attack's characteristic by 3, 
at strength plus one, AP minus two, damage one. So they're more of your anti-infantry clearance choice. So powerful melee, decent range with those heavy flamers, but possibly fairly fragile to anti-tank. You can take between one and three of them in a squad. The Mortifiers are a new version of the Penitent Engine, and have an improved weapon skill and ballistic skill of 3+, plus and 9 inch movement rather than 7. They only have a 6 up feel no pain type save, so are a little bit less durable, and they cost the same amount of points. These guys have the options to take heavy bolters instead of their heavy flamers, and they have some interesting shooting options, where Blaze of Agony special rule will allow them to treat their heavy bolters as assault 3, or their heavy flamers as pistol weapons. Again, they can either take the penitent flails or penitent boss blades for tailoring towards anti-tank or anti-infantry. And these guys, when they die on a 4+, plus, any enemy models within 1 inches suffer D3 mortal wounds. So two powerful variants there. I honestly think I might be tipped a little bit towards the mortifiers, just literally because they can have assault 3 heavy bolters, and I'd generally rather have heavy bolters than heavy flamers. We're getting towards the end of the units, and we've got the Sororitas Rhino. This one's your standard issue Rhino, with Axe of Faith, Shield of Faith, and Sacred Rites. It can only take one Storm Bolter, and can take a Hunter Killer Missile as well. The Sisters of Battle Unique Transport is the Immolator, which is 97 points when it's armed with a Twin Heavy Bolter, and essentially has the same defensive profile as the Rhino. It can swap out that Twin Heavy Bolter for a Twin Multi Melter, or Immolation Flamers, which are Assault 2d6, Strength 5, AP-1, Damage 1. Auto hitting, of course. The emulator can transport six Adeptus Ministorum infantry, so it's very much the razorback of the Battle Sisters world. To round off the data sheets, we have the Battle Sanctum, which will set you back 50 points. It's treated as battlefield debris, so you can't shoot it or destroy it once you've set it up, and it's treated as normal terrain, aside from two special rules, which are Blessings of the Saint, which means if you have any friendly units within six inches of the Battle Sanctum, you gain a Miracle Dice and Consecrated Ground, where you add plus one to your leadership if you're within six inches of Battle Sanctum, and take one from the leadership of Chaos Models while they're within six inches of the Battle Sanctum too. Personally, probably not worth 50 points just for those two benefits, plus the advantage of having a piece of mobile cover that you can deploy where you want, but it's certainly an interesting choice. Okay, so that's the units looked at. Let's move on to the Sisters' Warlord Traits and Relics. As is standard, we have six Warlord traits, and then some order-specific ones that we'll get onto in a bit. Firstly, we have Inspiring Orator, which will add plus one to the Warlord's leadership characteristic, and friendly order units can use the Warlord's leadership instead of their own when they're within six inches. Typically, if on a Canonist, this will be leadership ten, and should sort out any morale issues if you are running large squads of ten strong battle sisters. Next up, we have Righteous Rage, which is re-rolling charges for your Warlord, and you can re-roll the wound roll on a melee weapon on the first turn of combat with your Warlord. Probably the best value you're going to get out of this would be a souped up Canonis, either with a Blessed Blade or a Relic, and it does genuinely soup up her close combat abilities. The only issue is really getting her to close combat. Next we have Executioner of Heretics, which I'd pass on, it's just subtracts one from enemy leadership within six inches of the Warlord, needs to be close and leadership doesn't always come into effect. There's Beacon of Faith, a nice simple one, where at the start of each one of your turns you just gain an extra miracle dice if your warlord is on the table. Celestine has this. It's also not such a bad pick for a backfield buffing Canoness, who can just pump out an extra miracle dice every turn. Moving on, we have Indomitable Belief, which is a really strong one indeed. It's a 6 inch aura of adding plus 1 to your Shield of Faith in save for all units within 6 inches. Normally this will mean that you can go from a 6 plus invul save to a 5 plus invul save over quite a large proportion of your firebase or advancing sororitas battle line, and there are plenty of ways to get that even higher, such as combining it with Seraphim, who will be getting a 4 plus invul with this around. Finally we have Pure of Will, which is an anti-psychic warlord trait, which can allow you to deny it again with your Shield of Faith ability, and also you subtract 1 from psychic tests taken for enemy models while they're within 12 inches of the warlord and the Triumph of St. Catherine has this one. My top picks are Beacon of Faith and Indomitable Belief, as both of those are good ways to get more damage or defence from your army, and Sisters of Battle do have a stratagem, which will allow you to field an extra Warlord trait on the table, in addition to your named Warlord, so you could use it to buy in Pure of Will against a Psychic Heavy opponent, for example. Next we have the Relics of the Ecclesiarchy. These can be given to just the Adeptus Sororitas characters, typically Canonesses, or other ones such as Dialogus, or the other buffing characters, and you can just give the Book of St. Lucius to Ministorum Priests. The Book of St. Lucius gives plus three inches to their 
model's aura ability, giving everyone plus one attack nearby, which is very handy because he might not be able to make close combat at the same time as his squad, so this can help him buff a unit's attacks while not being right on the front line. Now let's have a look at the other relics. The first is the Blade of Admonition, which is a souped up blessed blade, strength plus two, AP minus three, and flat three damage, so it's really going to make a mess of any heretics and traitors, and makes your cannoness a lot more of a scary threat in close combat, particularly against medium infantry and light vehicles. Next we have the Brazier of Eternal Flame, which replaces the standard Brazier that the Canonist can get, and it acts as an anti psyker effect, having minus two for psychers to cast within 18 inches, very similar to the Collexus Assassin's ability. A very strong choice against psychers, meaning that they'll have to step back if they want to cast efficiently. Next we have a Relic Bolt Pistol that might actually be worth taking, you don't get many of these. It's called the Wrath of the Emperor, it's an 18 inch pistol 4 weapon with strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 2. So it's actually a really potent little force and it's kind of perfect for taking out things like Primaris Intercessors because of its flat damage too. This is honestly a really solid pick and it might well be better than focusing your cannoness on being a melee monster because she's not always going to be all that great at it at strength 3. She might just be better keeping out of trouble and close combat and hanging back to blaze away with this. I certainly think that this could be a solid choice for buying in as an additional relic on a minor character. Next we have Litanies of Faith where once per turn when you gain a miracle at dice you can re-roll that miracle dice hopefully turning more low rolls into high rolls which tend to be the more useful ones. Could be good for another support character buffing relic. We have the Mantle of Ophelia, which is a Canonist only and gives her a 3 up invul save, so a decent defensive upgrade there. We have the Triptych of the Macarian Crusade, which is a 5 plus feel no pain type save, so another decent durability buff. I say that typically the Triptych is going to be stronger than the Mantle of Ophelia, as it affects things like mortal wounds and low AP weapons as well. Finally, we have the Iron Surplus of Saint Alistia. This gives the model a 2 up save and wound rolls of 1, 2 or 3 always fail irrespective of any toughness or strength profiles. So a third strong durability upgrade for a sister's unit. To be honest while the durability upgrades are not too bad, I'd probably only typically consider them if I was going to be expecting to face a lot of snipers and otherwise hope that my character shielding units can hold firm and just not let the cannoness or things get shot in the first place. As the relics, my favourite are the Wrath of the Emperor, Litten is a faith for those rerolls, and the Book of St. Lucius for that boosted aura. So let's move on to the specific orders now then, the ones whose rules affect your entire army. Some units don't benefit from these order traits, Celestine doesn't, Priests and Ecclesiarchy Battle Conclave units don't, nor do Penitent Engines and Hospitallers and Dialoguses. But these units don't stop a detachment from getting the benefit of orders if they are included. First of all, we have our Martyred Lady. This one you'll gain a Miracle Dice for a unit that's destroyed from your army with the Acts of Faith rule in any one phase, and you get this on top of the Miracle Dice that you'll normally generate if a character of yours is slain. In addition to this, you also get plus one to hit from the unit if they've suffered any casualties in the game, which is really quite a powerful rule. So basically, if you do have a bunch of advancing Battle Sister squads and you take a multi melter in each of them, then if and when that Battle Sister squad takes a casualty, that multi melter will be hitting on twos for the rest of the game. That's a, quite a strong ability indeed, although admittedly it does only activate when your opponent has chosen to shoot the unit, so there is some counterplay to it. Their warlord trait is plus one wound and plus one to their saving throw, so you could have a very survivable warlord, say if you combine this with the five plus feel no pain warlord trait, and their relic is a strength nine boosted inferno pistol. Their stratagem will allow you to reroll ones against a unit that kills one of your characters. So if you do lose a character from our Master Lady, the entire rest of your army can gain reroll ones against the unit that killed them, which is quite nice to have as an option. Next we have Valorous Heart, who have a 6 plus feel no pain type save, where when you lose a wound, you roll a dice and on a 6 plus that wound is ignored. They also ignore AP minus 1 from AP minus 1 attacks, so those weapons will count as AP 0, and this does stack with the Imagifier's aura, where they'll ignore AP minus 2 for all units within 6 inches of him. This is a really potent little combo, and if you're playing this order, then I'd certainly make heavy use of that little strategy. Their Warlord trait is another 5 plus feel no pain type save, not massively overwhelming when they get 6 plus feel no pain as standard, and their relic is a relic casket that gives a 1 inch aura of minus 1 toughness to enemy models, so essentially when they're in close combat, this could help out your 
fighty sisters units with putting some decent damage on the enemy units which is a bit problematic to get into the right place because it does involve your character being in close combat their stratagem for one command point is for a shooter unit to ignore modifiers to hit which is a very good tool to have in the toolbox particularly when you have something like an exorcist firing at an eldar flyer that could have anything from minus three to hit if you can ignore that then obviously your damage output is going to be far better Next up we have the Bloody Rose, the murderous close combat orientated battle sisters. They get an extra minus one for all pistols and melee weapons, so your standard sisters will be striking at AP minus one in close combat, and they also get plus one attack on the first round of close combat when they've charged, were charged, or made a heroic intervention. So their combat units are going to be significantly more dangerous than ones from other orders. Their Warlord trait will allow them to advance and charge, and also give the Warlord plus one attack, and their relic is a chainsaw that has the exact same profile as the Teeth of Terror from Codex Space Marines, so strength plus one, AP minus two, and flat two damage, with three additional attacks. This is a really solid and often taken option in Codex Space Marines, so it can be a cheeky little upgrade to do a massive amount of damage, the main downside being that you'd have to take it on a character that doesn't have high mobility, so it might struggle to get into close combat. Their stratagem also doubles down on their combat ability. For one command points they gain plus one to wound, which is certainly a stratagem I make heavy use of with them, as typically being strength three, sisters will not usually have the best wound rolling in melee, so this is going to be incredibly valuable for them. Next we have the Ebon Chalice, who have one of the five up feel no pain type saves against mortal wounds, and for their acts of faith they have the option to spend two miracle dice and automatically count one of them as a six when you're using an act of faith. This is a pretty decent ability that will allow you to get rid of those low rolls and sacrifice them for a single very high roll, particularly good when you're using damage d6 weapons and things, or guaranteeing charges. Their warlord trait will also help out with high miracle dice rolls, as the first one you generate will automatically be a 6, and they also get plus d3 command points, which will be great for using those stratagems, so it's a really solid warlord trait, and if you're not using a second warlord trait for Ebon Chalice, this is certainly one to buy in with a stratagem, because you'll essentially be getting both of those abilities for free. They have a Relic Sniping Condemner Bolt Gun, which is 24 inch rapid fire, strength 5, AP minus 2, and damage D3, and it could give you a little bit of an option to surprise kill some enemy characters. They also have a synergy with Flamer weapons, where for two command points you can make their Flamers automatically have six shots in a single unit, a bit similar to the Salamander stratagem. From a quick read through I couldn't obviously see any units that had huge huge amounts of flamer weapons available to them, so it might be best to use on a retributor squad with those 12 inch heavy flamers, or something like that. We have the Ardent Shroud next, who can advance and shoot ranged weapons as if they hadn't advanced, similar to Talarn from Imperial Guard. These guys will be pretty mobile, and probably as strongest in an advancing sisters battle line, though honestly compared with some of the other orders, I'm not quite as impressed with this one for how much value you're going to get from it. It will keep you mobile though, and might help with getting your weapons in range, or scoring some objectives. Their warlord trait is a 6 inch heroic intervention, and fight first, I probably wouldn't bother with this one either. And their warlord's relic is a minus 1 to hit, relic that can provide a bit of a defensive buff to a vital character, though you do have quite a lot of options for making your characters more durable from the relic section already. And their stratagem is a 5 plus fill node pain type save against mortal wounds which isn't bad but is pretty situational. I'm afraid that these are probably the weakest of the orders, at least as far as I can tell at the moment. Finally we have the Sacred Rose. These have a trio of buffs where only one model in the unit can flee at maximum, so it makes it a bit more viable to be running 10 girl sister squads. Every time you use a miracle dice for an act of faith, you get a new one on a roll of 5+, plus, which will add up to a lot more acts of faith throughout the course of the game, and they also get 5 plus overwatch as well which is situational, won't help against all armies, but in the right circumstances can be devastating. I think these three add up to be a fairly strong overall order trait, particularly the Miracle Dice element. Their Warlord trait is that they automatically regenerate a Miracle Dice for every Miracle Dice act of faith used on them, so it encourages you to plug away and use lots of acts of faith for your Warlord, as they're kind of essentially free for her. Their relic is a holy brazier that can do its smite trick every single turn, not just once per game like the standard one, which is actually really quite a decent buy-in, as getting two or three smites out of this thing is really quite powerful, and obviously it's a really solid buy-in against demons. Finally, their stratagem is one command point to get extra hits on sixes when firing bolt weapons, best used on a big 10-man sister squad, 
or maybe a retributor squad with four heavy bolters or something similar could be handy when you just need a little bit of extra damage. So overall my take for all round strong sisters armies are that Valorous Heart and Sacred Rose are both pretty strong as standard orders. Our Martyr Lady is decent as well and has the notable advantage of allowing you to take Junith Aruta to buff your gun line. And Bloody Rose certainly looks like it's the strongest for a melee focused sisters force. Now we finally get on to stratagems, and there are quite a lot of stratagems in the sisters book. Four pages worth in fact when you take into account the order specific ones. First up for one command point we have open the relic for us. This is your standard take an extra relic stratagem and I do like it that it's just the one command point per extra relic that you include. Good for tailoring relics to your opponent in the pregame. Next for one command point we have embodied prophecy which you use to target a Zephyrim squad and it gives them an aura of reroll ones to wound in melee and this will affect the unit themselves as well. Could be great if you have multiple charging units nearby but the Zephyrim do innately reroll their wound rolls with their melee weapons so it won't actually benefit them. Next we have Furious Recital, which targets the Exorcist and gives a minus 1 leadership aura to units within 12 inches of it, or minus 2 to Chaos units. Perhaps situationally could be useful, but in general you're not wanting your Exorcists on the front line, as we don't want them getting locked up in close combat. Next we have Blazing Piety, also 1 command point, and you can use it if a Chaos model is within 6 inches of your Dialogus. That Chaos unit takes one mortal wound, and if there are demon units then they take d3 mortal wounds. I'd probably only use this on demons myself for the d3, and could just be a cheeky way to finish off a demon unit if you just need a little bit of extra damage output against them. You use this in the psychic phase by the way, which is a bit of a limitation as you don't know how your shooting is going to go yet. Next we have battle rights for one command point, and you use this if your warlord has the sacred rights ability and is on the tabletop. You can use this to roll a random d6 to replace one of your sacred rites that's in play with the randomly determined sacred rite. I'd say that the way that this is going to be best used is if you happen to roll a double on the sacred rites table when you're selecting the ones for your army to make sure you do get the two different effects. Or you could use it to re-roll one of the sacred rites if you roll one that isn't helpful, such as perhaps the leadership one. I'd say this could absolutely definitely be worth it, as it gives you the chance of getting another special rule for your entire army for just one command point. Next we have Moment of Grace for one command point. You use this just after you've made a hit roll, wound roll or save roll for an Adeptus Sororitas unit. Depending on how many miracle dice you chose to use, you add one to the result of that roll for every one that you used. So say you could use this to pass a save that you had just failed, or make a hit roll or wound roll that you had just failed as well. I'd see this as a bit of an alternative to the command re-roll, where you can actually guarantee that you are going to make the save for definite if you use this stratagem plus one or more miracle dice. So it's basically sort of like a boosted command roll. I can certainly see that coming in handy from time to time, when there are some rolls that are just incredibly helpful that could go your way, and it's one way to get rid of some of the lower miracle dice rolls that you're probably not going to use otherwise. Next we have Final Redemption, also 1 CP. This is used when a Sister Repentia unit is chosen for the target of attack made by a melee weapon. For every Sister Repentia that you lose in the fight phase, the unit that killed them will take a mortal wound on the roll of 4+. So it can be a way to get a little bit of extra revenge when you think they are just about to get wiped out by a big scary enemy threat. If you do lose quite a lot of them this turn, then you could get anything from like 4 or 5 mortal wounds from this. So it does have the potential to be quite powerful. Next we have Martyr's Immolation. This affects an Immolator model in your army when it's destroyed, and it just auto-explodes. Auto-explodes stratagems are great and can be really powerful. If you manage to have an Immolator die in the middle of your opponent's army, then it'll hand out D3 mortal wounds to every single unit within 6 inches of itself, no matter how many there are. This will certainly make Immolators a lot more of a thorny problem to deal with, as your opponent probably won't want to kill them while they have vital things too close to it. Certainly a great choice, if the situation presents itself. Next up we have Holy Trinity, where we can combine Melter, Bolt and Flame weapons. If one Adeptus Auroritas squad fires one of each weapons at the enemy unit it's targeting and declares all the rest of its shots at that unit too, and at least one of the Bolter, Melter Gun and Flamer weapons are all in range, then you'll get plus one to wound rolls for all weapons. Plus one to wound is a really powerful ability, particularly in the shooting phase, and this could be a great way to get more value out of all of those weapons, particularly with using a Bolter and Flamer to get Melters to be wounding on plus one, which they'll really like to be. Next we have Heroin in the Making. 
This is the extra warlord trait stratagem. One command point to nominate a non-named character model and generate a warlord trait for them, allowing you to pick a warlord trait to help you tailor to the opponent's army or just get another powerful ability into the fight. We have Holy Rage and our simple one command point stratagem where your battle sisters can charge even if they advance this turn. Could certainly help them reach some key targets. We have Martyrs for one command point which happens when your Warlord was destroyed and hasn't come back due to Celestine's ability or the Divine Intervention stratagem. If the Warlord doesn't come back with these, you just get D3 command points, so on average this stratagem will get you plus 1 command points when your Warlord dies. Obviously it's not ideal to be losing your Warlord, but this is a nice bonus should the worst come to happen. Next we have Venerated Saint, again for 1 CP. This will allow your Imagifier to use 2 of the Litanies of the Devout, so you could have the Ignores minus 1 AP, and also the Leadership buff or the Strength buff. Next we have Suffer Not the Witch, and you can use it either in the Shooting or Fight phase, and the unit that you target can be Roll or Wound Rolls against Psychers. This could be particularly powerful if you're shooting something like an Exorcist against a big Psyker model such as Magnus or Mortarian, or if you have a big squad of Tooled Up Sisters Repenture or something in combat with a Psyker or unit of Psykers. We have Last Rites for one command point. This is a stratagem for Hospitallers. It will basically allow you to take morale tests without the penalty for having lost units this turn. But I believe that you still take the morale test anyway, just in case you roll that one to generate a miracle dice. But you're basically not going to ever fail the test this way. Devastating Refrain, again 1 CP, is another Exorcist stratagem. And it'll allow you to re-roll the number of shots that the Exorcist gets with its main missile launcher. And you can re-roll any or all of the dice. I'd probably say not going to be typically worth one command point for this. Unless you absolutely need to eke out every single bit of damage potential from one turn. Deadly Descent is the Seraphim stratagem that we mentioned earlier. One CP to add 6 inches to the range of their pistols. So their hand flamers and inferno pistols will be 12 inches. And can shoot the turn that they come in from deep strike reserve. Their shooting happens in the movement phase with that boosted range to their weapons, and they can still fire again in the shooting phase, though obviously only their bolt pistols or plasma pistols and things will be in range, because the effect lasts just for the movement phase. Vessel of the Emperor's Will for 1 CP is used when you perform an act of faith for an Adept Sororitas character in your army, and you just gain back 1 Miracle Dice after you've used that act of faith, sort of essentially swapping out a CP for a Miracle Dice, which I'm not sure will typically be worth it, so I think that CP will be a lot more valuable on an individual basis. Test of Faith for one command point will allow you to gain an additional D3 Miracle Dice when you get one from either resisting a Psychic Test through Deny the Witch or rolling a 1 for your Morale Test. If you do need a few more Miracle Dice on the go, then this could be a bit better. Trading 1 CP for D3 Miracle Dice is a better trade-off. Blessed Bolts is another one command point stratagem, and it allows Storm Bolters to have an AP of minus 2 and damage characteristic of 2, so it will soup them up into quite nasty weapons indeed, but I believe you can only take 2 or 3 of them in a squad at maximum now. I might have to go back and check through the data sheets at some point to see if that's actually the case. Purity of Faith for one command point will allow you to stop a psychic power on the roll of a 4+, plus when it's manifested within 24 inches of your Adeptus Sororitas units, which is obviously great for throwing a spanner in the works in the opponent's psychic phase. Always great to have access to a powerful stratagem like this, just in case the large part of your opponent's battle plan revolves around one key power. Moving on to two command point stratagems now, we have Divine Intervention. When a Adept Sororitas character is slain, then you spend two command points and discard one to three miracle dice, and that model is set up again at the end of the phase, greater than one inches from enemy models with the number of wounds remaining corresponding to the amount of a miracle dice that you spent. This means that it's usually going to be worth it to have at least one miracle dice spare, just in case you need to do something like this, and it's good that they just automatically get back up, you don't have to roll on a 4 plus or anything like some other codexes have to. Next we have Faith and Fury, borrowing its name from a Psychic Awakening book. You use this stratagem when you've performed an act of faith to use for a hit roll, and you can use it for the wound roll as well. So say if you use a 5 for example, you might well be able to use that to auto hit and auto wound with one attack. Which isn't bad, but considering it's 2 command points plus a miracle dice, you really are paying through the nose to get that auto hit and auto wound. And particularly if you're using a high strength weapon, you might well have got that hit and wound anyway. So I'd probably save this for when you absolutely need one hit roll to go through. We have Storm of Retribution, also 2 CP. 
and you apply this to a Retributor squad, and you can choose one of the following three effects, depending on whether you want to buff Heavy Bolters, Heavy Flamers, or Morty Melters. The Heavy Bolters get plus one to hit, the Heavy Flamers get reroll to wound, and the Morty Melters get plus 12 range and plus one damage. Of the three, I'd say the Morty Melter and the Heavy Flamer ones are better than the Heavy Bolter one. Morty Melters do suffer from their lack of range, and boosting it up to 36 inches might well get you in range as per the Melter rule. It's a reasonably expensive stratagem at 2 CP, but does reward you with some additional damage output. We have Exceptional Prophecy for 2 command points. This will give your Celestian squad 4 rerolls to hit and wound, so essentially old Gilliman style rerolls for 1 squad for 2 CP. Obviously this is going to be better used on as big a squad as you can possibly get, and it will massively increase their damage output against all targets. The only caveat to this is that they already get those 4 rerolls to hit if they're within 6 of a cannoness, so this is going to be a lot more use if they for some reason haven't got a cannoness next to them, or their cannoness has been slain. Still could be very handy, equip these ones with a load of bolters and maybe a special and heavy weapon, and they'll have some incredibly reliable damage output. Judgment of the Faithful for 2 CP will allow you to shoot after you've fallen back and also charge, so if you need an exceptional amount of flexibility with a squad in close combat, then this is the stratagem for you, though it is pricey. In the right situation, this could certainly be worth it. Extremist Trigger Word for 2 command points is used for Arco Flagellants, and instead of rolling D3 for their Arco Flails, you just get a flat 3. So if you did have a squad of 10 of these, you'd theoretically be up to 63 attacks, or over 90 if you take a priest into account. I think that this one could definitely be worth it, particularly if you're buffing a large squad. And finally, last but no means least, is the Desperate for Redemption stratagem. It's the only three command point stratagem in the book, and it allows a squad of Sisters Repenture, Penitent Engines, or Mortifiers to fight again. These guys all have incredibly large damage output, particularly if they're in big squads. So this could be an absolutely great use of three command points. I just remember that the Sister Repentia are pretty fragile, so if you are in combat with something that you're likely to want to fight against, against, you might well lose a fair few casualties before you do so, which could limit the scope of this stratagem a bit. Nevertheless, fighting again is one of the most powerful options in all of 40k in terms of damage output and maneuverability and positioning, so it's awesome to have that option. So overall, I think that this is a decently strong and very well written codex. I think that we're going to see most of the units in this book be fairly viable, at least in some extent, and there's certainly decent scope for making a sister's army fight very differently, depending on which order and sacred rites you choose to go with. They've got strong abilities in Shield of Faith and Miracle Dice, and for the most part their strongest warlord traits and relics are the ones that increase these to get the most out of them. Certainly if I have time over the next few weeks, I'll be covering some Sisters of Battle units. I'll be trying to do one or two each week, in addition to all the other fun stuff that we usually do on this channel. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, so you don't miss any of the other Sisters of Battle videos, or all of the other tactical videos that we put out, largely around Space Marines and Imperial Guard at the moment. I do have a Patreon page, if you'd like to support the channel and help me focus on this as a bit more of a full-time thing, then any support is appreciated. And of course, a massive thank you to all of the people who are already Patreons. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.